and Second Chronicle mainly. Uh, and we want to look this morning, before we move on, and to what else we can learn about the life of Solomon. We talked a lot about Solomon's, yes, uh, last week. And uh, when we go to the first uh, slides, we're going to talk about uh, Solomon's son mainly today. But just before we do, we look back to Solomon's life. And we find out that Solomon, it says in the Bible, Solomon loved the Lord. Do you love the Lord this morning? This is, this is simple, but this is the essence. This is the, the foundation. This is the most basic uh, principle, that the most important things in our life. Do you love the Lord? Do you know the Lord? Do you appreciate the Lord? Do you, do you tell Him that you love Him? So Solomon loved the Lord, and he walked in the manner of his father David. So that is very important because the second chronicle is about uh, how God has blessed. Well, first of all, if we go a little bit far, uh, back, backward, we will see that God promised David uh, that he would bless his inheritance, his descendants, and that there would always be one of his son on the throne. So we are learning in this book that God is faithful to fulfill his promise and to bless the descendants of David. So Solomon, his son, became king. Last night I was talking a little bit with the youth about uh, Solomon as well. And one of the first things, I didn't mention it, but it's amazing to realize, it's a family story in fact, is that we could look at the uh, genealogical uh, line, the tree line of, of David and Solomon. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about uh, grandpa and dad and uh, the, the son and the grandsons and we are going on in that, in that line. That's what we're going to do to these books. I'm a grandpa so it, it, it speaks to me. I was just realizing it just uh, lately. This is it's talking about family stuff. This is, this is us. We are, we are into that. When Solomon was born, he was born of a curious relationship and why he was himself chosen by God to be the, the, the king, the next king in line. It's also amazing because it's not David who appointed his son Solomon. It is God who, who made David appoint his son. And the, 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 the strange things into this relationship is that he came out of a, a legitimate relationship. He murdered the husband of Bathsheba, he slept with her. The first baby that came died. But then Solomon came as a comfort, as a, as a confirmation that the sin was forgiven and all this. But he came out of a relationship that should not have existed to begin with. But nevertheless, it did happen. And God is showing us again mercy and grace. This, this is a story of grace that we see. And Solomon, being born out of this background, is selected by God. That, that, is, that is very amazing. God says, David, this is the one. He had other brothers because uh, David had also many wives and many children. And he had other brothers who were older than him. They should have been the king. But instead, God himself said, I want Solomon. This is Solomon. When he was born... He says that uh, uh, they call him Solomon, but God sent uh, Nathan the prophet to see the parents. Says you will call him Jedidiah because it means the Lord loves him, and that's that's how we start with Solomon. And now we look at his life at the beginning of his life, and he loved the Lord. Well, praise the Lord, and he walked in the manner of his father David. David is the measuring, the measuring standards. You live according. And when we say that, that David is the measuring standards, we need to understand a bit of the context why we're saying that. We're not saying that David was perfect. This we know. He shed a lot of blood. He was a man of war. And he committed a crime and he um, a murdered and uh, adultery and things like that. That's not what we're looking about. We're looking about the heart. That's why our title this morning is Divided Hearts, or Hearts Divided, or Divided Kingdom. So that we are going to look at. So, 
And the story of Israel and Judah, you will see that the main point that what concerns God is idolatry, faithfulness to God, obedience, loving the Lord, following the Lord. And this why David is being praised or commended by God, because David never turned to idolatry. David didn't turn to other God. He was always really focused and faithful and loyal to God, always. So that is why he has become the, the measuring stick. So when it says that he walked in the manner or according to the way of his father David, that's very important. Last week we saw how God blessed Solomon beyond measure, gave him a breadth of mind. And we talked about how a genius that he was, in fact. And because God made him exceedingly great. He was wiser than all men. He was like the, the most important person to meet. It's, it's, it's like uh, people who are seeking uh, to go and hear someone today, like he's the, like the guru of this generation, if we want to put it in the modern terminology, but people want to hear King Solomon, and they went from all, all the nations to go. But these gifts that God gave Solomon beyond measure, these gifts were conditional. It came with the conditions, and then you see, uh, hear it. it. God says, if you walk in my ways, you keep my laws and my commands, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen and prolong your day. So Solomon must not turn from the ways of the Lord. He must remain faithful to the Lord. But unfortunately, we read in Kings, which is not Chronicles, because in, in Chronicles, there is no mention of Solomon's failures, and that is something that we will discuss at some point in our series. But in Kings, you see the failures, what happened. That in, toward the end of his life, his wives, I had so many wives and concubines, turned away his heart. The first wife that he had is actually a pagan wife uh, from Egypt. So already he's breaking the rule of the Lord already to begin with. But later on he married many more. So we read that his, his wives turned away his heart. And what it means here in the language of the Bible, they, they bent his heart, his heart went down, and it caused his heart to yield to the demand of these wives and to the, their idols and their religion and things like that. He declined in that way. So Solomon uh, turned away from the Lord. When Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true. And you will see the word holy in that uh, Bible version, but actually it says, uh, and some of your Bible says, his heart was not perfect. His heart was not perfect. His heart was not wholly true to the Lord. His heart was not, uh, his heart was divided. It was not totally unto the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not, again, wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. So this morning we are stopping there and we are thinking and applying it into our lives. How is our heart this morning? How is your heart? For those of you who have been a Christian a long time, that's a very good message. And that's a very good uh, reflection to take to heart. Because when we start in a new relationship, it's like uh, falling in love and starting dating, like you are so excited, everything is perfect, you're on cloud nine, isn't that? And then uh, after you become uh, uh, married a few years, sometimes this uh, wonderful feeling of being in love, a bit uh, cool off a little bit. And then we start taking each other for granted. Anyway, it's, it's, it's a story that we hear a lot. So with the Lord, it's similar to that. When you get really convicted of sin and your burden of sin is lifted and Jesus Christ is revealed as your loving Savior and He's accepting you, wow! And then you, I remember the joy and the excitement to just discovering the Bible. Oh, there was not enough uh, hours in the day just to read the Bible and just to, to discover the Bible. So now... How about our heart right now? Like for those of you who are older, if you are young in the Lord, the same thing is true. Keep your heart. The word holy is important. 
whole, complete, perfect, following the Lord, loving the Lord above any, anyone. And then in verse 9, we continue, the Lord, because of that, was very angry with Solomon for his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who, as we mentioned last week, had appeared to him twice. And big, big time appearance, like God blessed him, spoke to him, told him that he was answering his prayer, that he has heard his prayer at two moments of his life. And between these two appearances, fire came down and God manifested himself and he gave him success and wisdom beyond. So God did a lot for him. But here it says that he, even though he appeared to him twice and blessed him so much, he had warned Solomon specifically about worshiping other gods, but Solomon did not listen to the Lord's command. So let's look at some uh, uh, aspect of the spiritual neglect over here. When it says about, we already discussed about the change of heart. And a heart is something that is always evolving. Your heart, my heart, and our relationship with the Lord evolves. It's not always constant. It's not because you were at one point in your life really focused and devoted to the Lord that it will always be like that. This, you know that, I know that, but I'm, I'm just reminding us. Our heart is evolving with a lot of situations. And our society today is very much telling us uh, we have so many voices that comes to us and, and our society is telling us that Christianity is not relevant anymore. Because uh, when many people look at the Old Testament, the New Testament, they don't know how to apply the values of the Bible into our modern society that is so tolerant and you own everything. So there's a lot of young people, your children, that will be confronted. And, uh, you know, when you think about the LGBT, and the transgender, and uh, you know, uh, the the marriage, the gay marriage, and all of these issues, abortion. Now, euthanasia is becoming like they, they changed the, the the terminology because before you heard about euthanasia, it was kind of, oh, that's bad. You you're forcing someone to die, but today is like helping them to die in a honorable way. It's very different, the, the terminology and the approach. So what's wrong with helping someone who suffers a lot to, to, to die? So there's a lot of very hard, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not criticizing all of these conversations. These are real conversations and real issues in society. But I'm saying that it is very hard now for Christian to defend or to stand on, upon your values or to explain your values in, in a way that it is uh, understandable in, in a modern society. So there's a lot of things that comes to, to move our hearts away or to cause it to decline, to bend it or to cause confusion into our heart. So it is possible, we all have the potential to lose on, on that, that our heart that was strong in the Lord at one point and devoted at one point, maybe is not at some point because it's been disturbed, because it's been confronted, and it is something that we need to settle. This is my heart. This is my relationship with the Lord. This is my faith. I'm saved by faith, by grace. I'm going to heaven, but it is my heart that needs to make its decisions and keep on this relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and remain faithful. Uh, there's a lot of things happening in our society that comes against that. So we, we talk about the heart bending away, declining, being overthrown by it's too, it's too much. I heard someone told us today, I cannot believe anymore. I was actually this week in a pastor's meeting in Highland uh, ECC. We were having our monthly prayers and I had a conversation with another friend. Many of you know, know him, this pastor. He's, anyway, we were talking about people who have been Christians who are declaring, I cannot believe anymore. And it's not that they, are, uh, uh, that they wanted to be atheists, but what we are reading this morning is happening to them. It is happening to them right now. I cannot accept it anymore. I cannot believe it as, as I used to. 
so it's hard for me to, to go on. So the, the heart sometimes becomes overthrown and turned aside. Then his attitude, uh, the way he used to live by, had also changed. Because we read that the last uh, statement about Solomon, he did not listen. It led him to that point. He did not listen to the Lord's command. And uh, here, when it says that, it's the word shamar. It's usually translated to obey or carefully follow carefully, to pay attention to something. The word sh shamar. We, I've talked to, uh, to shama and shamar uh, months ago. But anyway, that's the listen with attention. It is also include like setting some edge uh, over a heart, like a, a protective uh, and limit. And it could also mean regarded not. He did not follow. He did not consider it as important as it should have been. The way you look at something, either it is important or it becomes lesser important. And this is what we read at some point, at, at, at this point in the life, experience of Solomon. Solomon did not consider the ways of the Lord as his father uh, walked. It, like so important anymore. He did not listen, he did not pay attention to that. And unless we determine to stay close to God every day and walk in His ways, like He says, we can begin to backslide spiritually. I mean, we don't like to think about it. We will not judge ourselves. We, we would not Thing that it would ever happen to us, but it is always possible. It is always possible. And maybe some of you are struggling secretly because this is not often something that people will talk openly to other Christians. It's something that you deal by yourself, and sometimes you will talk with other non-Christian friends. You will, but in the Christian community, it's, it's a bit hard to talk about these things, opening your, your thoughts and your, when you are confronted. And you, if you are backsliding spiritually, it's very hard. So usually what will happen, it remains uh, hidden. It remains a secret that only you will deal with that for a while, and then one day we will not see you anymore. You will just be gone. So we don't want that. But we see in the Bible, you know, one thing with the Bible that proves, again, the, the, the veracity and the truthfulness of the Bible, it's its honesty. You have this greatest king that God has blessed, and you see his failures reveal. They are explained in a way that we can see it and that we can learn from it and we can uh, apply it to ourselves and learn some lessons. So unless we, you and I, are determined to stick close to God every day and walk in His ways and pay attention to Him, unless we do it daily, unless we set our hearts, then we, it is possible that there would be a backsliding, a, a, a cooling off, a, a walking away, a bending of the heart. And the result is that a conscience becomes, be, begins to harden, and then you don't see when you compromise, and then it just move on, and then you slip away into other things. So that's what we read. And then Solomon's sins would lead to his kingdom being divided into two separate kingdoms. And then we find it in, in this text here. So now the Lord said to him, Since you have disobeyed my decrees, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your servants. But for the sake of your da father David, I will not do it. While you are still alive, I will take the kingdom away from your son. So now we move on in the family line. We go to, to the son and the grandson. But again, I want just to, to stress that the, the text we looked at were from the story from the kings. In the Chronicles, there is not a single mention of Solomon's failures. He just end up with the descriptions of his riches, of his wisdom, the queen of Sheba comes and says, oh, she becomes breathless. That's how the part of Solomon finished in Second Chronicle. Because there's a purpose for that, but I will skip it for this morning. Let's go to uh, Rehoboam, the, the son. 
He says, I will take it away from your son. Rehoboam, okay, before we go to Rehoboam, let's, let's think family this morning, okay? Your grandfather, your great-grandfather, or your father, and all of these things. Let's think about uh, the genealogy of your, of your family. And now, like, imagine you have the two greatest king, heaven. I, I mean, you're not talking about just, just a king. You're talking about the greatest king of all time. David, he's a war hero, he's a fighter, he's a military man. He's, uh, the nations, surrounding nations are paying tribute, taxes, they have been subdued. His army won all the battles. Uh, everybody is submitted, like this, this is his kingdom. This is the grandfather. He's, that, that's the man, the man, like the model, like the, the superhero. He, his, his picture is on the, every magazine uh, of, the, of the year. Uh, he's the success of, of time. Then come his son that even goes beyond. So you have the grandfather, then you have the father that uh, we have described him a lot last week. So now you have the grandson. How would it be for grandson Rio Boham to grow up in such a family? I, I, I never read this story like thinking, approaching it in this way, but think about the grandson. What was his life like? How were his parents? What did he learn? Where did he go to school? What, what was his friends? Who were allowed to be his friend? How much money, uh, how, much, how much pocket money did he have in weekends? How much freedom did he have? Uh, what school did he go to? Uh, think about how, how would it be to grow up in such a family? This is, this is hard for us to even think about it. How would you be treated if you'd be Roboham? growing and King David is your grandfather and Solomon is your father. How would it be to grow up in such a family? What kind of training? Was he trained? Was he prepared to be a king? Uh, did he know in advance? Uh, how was his life? Would you be ready if you would be Rehoboam to undertake to rule an empire so vast as he was given? such an empire from all on the other side of the Euphrates River until the Mediterranean, until Egypt, then suddenly you inherit all of this. You're a young man. Well, actually, he says he was 41 year old. We will see that later when he began to rule. To, to rule. But then he, he ruled for 17 years. Would you be ready to undertake something like that? To administer all the things that Solomon was administering. You know when the Queen of Sheba uh, came? She was breathless to just uh, see the administration style, the managing, the costumes, the food, uh, the decorations, the, the greatness, and all the styles and everything, like the horses that he had, and, and the, the military, the, the the organizing of such, the, the tributes, the taxes that would come, people would bow and obey him. And now suddenly, grandson just be walking down, and he, he, he's stepping into big shoes. So how, how, does, how can you handle such a thing like that? So I wanted you to, to think in, that, in terms like this before we look at his life. What about his social life, his family? So we see here, Rehoboam went to Sikkim, where all Israel had gathered to make him king. So that is the beginning that you learn about him as a king. And then we know the little conversation. They ask, your father was a hard master. They said, lighten the harsh labor demands and heavy taxes that your father imposed on us. Then we will be your loyal subjects. King Solomon, well, we, we need to make a switch also between the two if we want to understand what's happening. King Solomon built for more than 20 years. 
the, uh, you saw a picture of the temple last week, but the city that he built and the house that he built to all of his wives, and, uh, and it was a, a majestic city. It was gold. He says that uh, silver had no value in his time. Everything was made in gold. So, so it, it's hard to imagine such a, such a beautiful place that he made, okay? So, but I think that to make this happen, they were needed heavy taxes and workloads, heavy workloads to all the nations. So, okay, the beginning, you, you're great, you, you, you have peace, and you, you, you live in a prosperity a context and society, but there is hardship built over the years, disappointment, and people are getting angry and tired. So now there's a, there's a chance for us normal people we have a new king, so let's ask him to uh, lessen the workload, the taxes, and make it easier for us. So they are asking, and then that's not what happened, and he harshly replied to them that he will treat them worse than the fathers. So there's something for us to learn on that. If you look at uh, the, the personality of Rehoboam, the first point this morning, we're learning a few lessons from him. When you look at him and you read the, the, these, these following scriptures here, you will see that uh, at first look, first sight, he shows the appearance that he wants to do the right thing. He says, come back in a few days. I will consult with my father's advisors and I will answer to you, which he did. So the father's advisors advised him, yes, these people are right. Lesson the workload, and they will follow you, they will be loyal. But Roboam turned to his friends, the, the, the friends that he grew up with, and says, no, don't do that. Show them you're the man. And then you are going to treat them, uh, make them obey and uh, impose something like, don't let them win over you, something like this. So then he listened. So what do we learn from Roboam at this point is that something that we often will do when we see we are seeking the Lord's will or when we are in a crossroads and in, in front of many decisions. It's like we will give often the appearance that we want to do what is right, but actually we are uh, only willing to take the advice that will suit what we want to do at first. Uh, have, you, have you noticed that? You've already decided in your heart what you want. A boyfriend, a girlfriend, especially in these areas of uh, strong emotions and passions. This is also, oh Lord, show me if I shall marry him or her. And then the, anything that would come to disagree with this, you will push it away, you will reason, justify, this is not God, no, because my mind is already set, my emotions are already engaged and all this. So he's, he's done that. So he's actually just seeking confirmation of his own will. So we have a, a, a bit of a beginning of an idea and to the character and the personality of that king. So the, the kingdom gets divided and 10 tribes goes away and then he is left with one tribe, the tribe of Judah, which is according to the faithfulness of the Lord. So Rehoboam declared war, and he raised 180,000 soldiers, foot soldiers, and he's going to attack them and force them to come back. And then the prophet come to him. The Lord says to Shemaiah, the man of God, this is what the Lord says, do not fight against your relatives, go back home, for what has happened is my doing. So they obeyed the message of the Lord and did not fight against Jeroboam. So, praise the Lord, they obeyed. They, they, they did not do what was against the Lord's will, and they obeyed. And when they obeyed the prophet, during the time that followed, his rule over that one uh, 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 tribe uh, was strengthened. Uh, he, he, he fortified cities, he developed his militaries, and uh, during this time, Jeroboam, the king of the northern kingdom, uh, made some false gods, and then he rejected the priests and the Levites that were followers of the true God, because Jeroboam had made uh, calves and uh, altars to idols. So he rejected all the Levites and the, and the priests, and they returned 
even though they were not from Jude, the tribe of Judah, they returned to be with Rehoboam over there. And it says from them that all those, and that's important for us, all those who were determined to seek the Lord God returned to Jerusalem. I will repeat that, that's important. So these priests and Levites that returned to the Rehoboam kingdom were those who were determined to seek the Lord God. And then the result of that is that in verse Oops, 17. Did I skip that? So, okay, verse 17 here. They made the kingdom of Judah stronger and made Rehoboam the son of Solomon strong for three years. You know, when you read carefully and then you pay attention, you will notice like a timeline, some events, the calendar of how things happen. So for three years, they walked in the way of David and Solomon. So there's something good. These priests and Levites return. So yes, we are the true followers of God. And they were determined to seek the Lord, uh, these, these people. So they, they are influencers. They influence the king. They influence the nations. The nations remain faithful to God. There's a time of prosperity. God bless the land when there is obedience in the land. And that is one of the principles that we find in Chronicles. When the king and the nation follows the way of the Lord, there will be a time of prosperity. God is pleased. God will uh, answer to faithfulness in that way. Because in these books, uh, one of the theological lessons that we need to learn this morning when we look at these books, it's always we are learning about God by looking at how God uh, relates, how God converse, how God react, and what God wants. People versus God, king and God, uh, people and God. The, the people make a choice, God react. God gives instructions, the people make a choice to obey or not obey, God reacts to that. So you get to learn about God by looking at how he's dealing with, uh, with these people. So these people make the kingdom stronger and they make the man, the king, stronger also because they are positive influencers. And I think that is very important for us also because you can see the role in that that you have in the church. Because we're talking about my people, the, the people, the tribal, the, the, the community together are following the Lord. When you are, are a, a positive influencer in the Lord, you play a very important role to make your church stronger and better because you are the influencers. You are part of the problems or you are part of the solutions. You contribute or you don't contribute. You serve or you don't serve. You, you, your heart is turned toward, you pray for your church, you love your church. So when you relate to others, you, you bring freshness, you bring love, you bring something good, you bring wisdom, you bring good advice. So the church benefits from that. So we learned that for three years, remember, it's for three years, okay? So we, we learned this after these three years, Rehoboam and the people forsook the Lord. That is so, so sad. So that's, we will see the second uh, mistake at this point of Rehoboam's. It's prosperity caused him to become proud and lead him to abandon the Lord. At the height of his power, wow, now he's, he's, he's in control, he's firmly established and everything. After he had consolidated his rule, Rehoboam abandoned the Lord's law along with all of Israel with him. Because he had been unfaithful to the Lord during the fifth year of King Rehoboam's reign, King Sishak of Egypt attacked Jerusalem. So you see an effect. Three years they stop, they are proud, they don't care about the Lord, they abandon, and the people follow in this way. So the Lord, because of that, will send uh, enemy nations. And then when you go to the next verse, you will see that the prophet Shemaiah then met with Rehoboam and Judah's leaders. 
And he says, this is what the Lord says, you have abandoned me, so I am abandoning you to Sishak. Again, you see the conversation here, you see the, the relationship between God, how God deals with people's choice. Then the leaders of Israel and the king humble themselves and says, the Lord is right in doing this to us. So at least at this point, they acknowledge that they are wrong, God is right, so they humble themselves. When the Lord saw their change of heart, he also changed his heart. He gave this message to Shemaiah, since the people have humbled themselves, I will not completely destroy them, and I will soon give them some relief. I will not use Sishak to pour out my anger on Jerusalem. So we see that conversation. They are proud. They forsake the Lord. The Lord sent a nation to attack them. They are afraid. The prophet comes, says, it's because you abandoned the Lord. Okay, Lord, you are right in this judgment. So they humble themselves. The Lord says, okay, I'm changing uh, my way to them. So the, the prophet blames Rehoboam and Judah. It's your fault if you that. But because they humble themselves, at the last moment, they just avoid total destruction. So in the next scriptures, you see that King Sisha of Egypt attacked Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the Lord's temple and the royal palace, he took everything, including the gold shields that Solomon had made. King Jeroboam made bronze shields to replace them. That's, it, it looks like not really important, but actually it's quite important. Uh, you see consequences here. However, even though Jeroboam wasn't destroyed, he still faced the humiliation of having another nation's dominate on them. So that is something also. Sin will bring always a, a, a humiliation. Sin will always bring a consequence on that, okay? So you, you may be set free, you may not be destroyed, but there will be something negative that will result out of, the, of that sin. But God is so rich in mercies that he kept that tribe. He did not destroy them. So, but what we see here is that the glorious riches of the Lord's temple are carried away under his nose. It is humiliating on that point. And Rehoboam, let's go to the golden shields. The golden shields is like in the time of Solomon, Solomon was so rich, he had so much gold being brought to him every year that he made golden shields that he would keep in the temple. So the king, Sishak of Egypt, take these golden ship and sh uh, shields and then take them to Egypt. So Rehoboam changed them into bronze shields. So what can we learn fr about him? What does he do? And in the comments that I was reading, this was like, instead of humbling himself, he replaced the gold by the bronze. And these were, uh, we can say, instruments that were in the temple of the Lord. It's part of the, of the worship. Uh, we read in, the, uh, in that story of Chronicles that when King Rehoboam would go to worship in the temple, the soldiers would bring the golden shields into the temple, and then when he would leave, they would bring him somewhere else to protect them. So now he's replacing them. So instead of humbling himself before the Lord, he's just, so what? I'm just changing gold for bronze. It's the same thing. But there's a, there's a symbol uh, in this here. Gold has a value of purity. Bronze is a cheap imitation of the real things. Their heart for worship was not really holy, pure, or set unto the Lord. Gold, bronze, there's no difference. It's some sorts of a compromise. You don't need to live for the Lord 100%. You can just whatever. So at first glance, he seemed pure, but his worship is a cheap imitation of the real thing. So we can see that in that application. Another thing, another mistake that he has done, he really lost or neglected the true worship. In the days uh, around the temple, worship was always around the temple. The, the social society lived around the temple. So Rehoboam had allowed false worship. 
uh, when you look at the next scriptures, you will see during Rehoboam's reign, the people of Judah did what was evil in the Lord's sight, provoking his anger with their sin, for it was even worse than that of their ancestors. For they built, they went beyond, further away. They built shrines. They built Asherah poles under every, every, they even had male and female pro shrines prostitutes, and they imitated the detest detestable practices of the pagan nations the Lord had driven from the land. So they really, Rehoboam and the people that really a divided heart to the Lord, okay? He was quite happy. They still had the temple, but he was also happy to have the shrines. So this is right. Oh, this is okay also. So you can see that uh, worship was not really something from the heart. He was also uh, worshiping foreign gods at the same time. You worship this, you're okay. You worship that, it's okay also. It represented the spiritual state of the people. And if you look on the outside, it looks good. The temple is still there. The brown shield is still there. They still go to the temple, but it represents what is happening. It's empty inside. So when you go to a summary of the reign of Rehoboam, and we'll close with that, we will read these scriptures. Because Rehoboam humbled himself, the Lord's anger was turned away, and he did not destroy him completely. There were still some good things in the land of Judah. Dep depending on your Bible version, it might be said in a different way. There were still some good things, and the kingdoms was not all bad. So it's not completely bad, but it's not really good either. So the Lord's anger was turned away. He humbled himself in a way, but just enough. But the heart was still not there. So some good things are still fitting way to characterize the reign of Rehoboam. There's some good things there. Verse 13, and King Rehoboam strengthened himself at Jerusalem and reigned. For Rehoboam was 41 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem. And to conclude his estimation, his evaluation, and he did evil, for he did not set his heart to seek the Lord. That is the conclusion of a life of a man. This is what God sees and what the Holy Spirit is writing about us. And I, I just want to explain a little bit about he did not set his heart by looking at other Bible versions of the Ascended. Uh, he did not prepare his heart. That's what the King James says in other older versions. He prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. Another one says, by not setting his heart, setting his mind, setting his heart. He was not determined to seek the Lord. He's, that is what qualifies him at the end of 17 years of rules. A little bit of this, it's okay. A little bit of that, it's okay. Uh, disobedience here, obedience a little bit. Humble here when you get in trouble, and then you, you go on, and at the end says, he did evil, for he did not set his heart to seek the Lord. That's why I call this message divided hearts, divided kingdoms, because that is the sad message you have. Uh, Mr. Spurgeon that we often quote, that's always have a very smart uh, uh, way to look at that, says, you see how Rehoboam went first toward gods, then toward idols, then back again toward God, he was always ready to shift and change. He didn't bring any reforms in the land. He didn't hold a great Passover as Ezekiel did. The high places were not taken away. But as soon as Shishak was gone, he felt perfectly content. There was nothing real or permanent in his religion. And it would be sad if this similar uh, attitude of heart would be developing in our own heart. Huh? It wouldn't be. Huh? Because that's not what Grandfather David did. Grandfather said, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Wait on the Lord, be courageous, and you will make your heart strong. Wait, I say. 
wait on the Lord. So David sought the face of the Lord, but Roboam, the grandson, did not seek. And it is, it is sad. Roboam inherited the spiritual promises the kingdom, the riches, the blessing of God. And he could have enjoyed it and just move on with all of this wealth and power, the promises, the spiritual inheritance of his father and grandfather. And for us, we should not make the same sorts of mistakes because all of us, we have received significant blessings in our life and the promises of God that we have and, and the, the promise that God will walk with us and bless our families, bless our descendants and, the, and our children's children. And we have uh, these wonderful, most remarkable promises uh, of the Lord in our life. The right to access God, the right to come near to God, access to the King of Kings. But we can find ourselves losing out on what God has for us or for the church also because we're talking not only individually but as a church. We can lose out as a church, as a people of God, what God would have uh, given us or wish that we would uh, be going. So that's the lessons that we are learning. Seek God's will and not our own will. Do you really want to know the answer when you ask God, show me your will, show me the directions, show me and I will obey me. What do you want me to do, Lord, or do you just want him to make you feel good, pat you on the shoulder? Humble ourselves before our God and restore true worship. Let's not keep up appearances of religion in our life, but as, uh, have our hearts grow cold. Rehoboam replace the shields with cheap imitation, and we don't want to do that. So at the end, as we stand this morning, we want to pray in closing, God, Lord, give me an undivided heart. Amen? Can you do that this morning? Let's, let's stand and, and close this morning. Hallelujah.